Our speaker tonight is a licensed funeral director and embalmer for their family's four funeral homes. After her first child was born and a plan to motivate herself to lose 70 pounds, she signed up for the Miss Alabama pageant. She lost the 70 pounds and won Miss Congeniality. She started her pageant career in Clow at an early age when she was crowned Miss Chitlin Queen. And Clow's known for its chitlins. She is, a, she is loving every minute of being a kiki. Anyone who has grandchildren knows what that is. That's what all her little grandchildren call her is kiki. One of their adorable names that grandchildren give their grandmothers. She enjoys riding horses, swimming, bicycling, and riding. She has a blog that has primarily been dedicated to writing about her experiences with having a child in addiction. She composed and printed a book titled Success Southern Style, and we have some of those to give out tonight as door prizes. It's an inspirational and humorous sayings in her book. So it's just an honor and a pleasure for me to introduce one of my home county gals, Kim Carpenter Cahey. Thank you, Chauncey. Um, is my mic right, you think? I'm trying not to wear glasses, so I have made the font on my notes as large as it can. They're on a 48, so that's when you see this big stack of papers, that's what's going on. Uh, your speaker tonight was supposed to be a 250-pound, 20-year-old with long hair and tattoos. Well, instead, you got a 29-year-old weighing 120 pounds with short hair, no tattoos. <laughs> The only true part of that is that I have short hair and I have no tattoos. Uh, Tina and Chauncey and our families go way back. So I would say if you needed some dirt on Tina and Chauncey, I could supply it. But they probably have the same amount of dirt on me. So don't ask. I started a blog and it is primarily focused on my son's addiction. It is entitled Beautiful People Do Not Happen. The poem was written by Dr. Elizabeth Kupler Ross. And I want to read it to you because I believe that all of you are beautiful people. The most beautiful people we have known are those that have known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, known loss, and have found their way out of the depths. These people have an appreciation, a sensitivity, and an understanding of life that fills them with compassion, with gentleness, and with a deep loving concern. Beautiful people do not just happen. The information I'm sharing with you tonight is a compilation of our family's experiences with addiction. I thank you for the opportunity to be your keynote speaker tonight. I stand here and wish that my son had been able to present to you, but beneath the crust of a young man struggling with being a recovering drug addict, he's now dealing with the rawness of chronic depression, bipolarism, anxiety disorders, OCD, and PTSD. The week before last was great. He practiced his speech, which is his life story. And I told your association director, I told Tina, if she might not be the association director, but she was the one I was communicating with, I was talking to Tina and Chauncey and I said he's doing great, he's practicing and his message is very powerful. And then this past week, right before the presentation, he started declining and he got himself in a pretty bad place with depression and anxiety. 
So by Wednesday, I knew I had better start getting ready to tweak his presentation. And I had to change his story from him telling it to me telling it from a mother's standpoint. RJ would have been, and that's my son's name, RJ, would have been giving you a first-hand account of addiction and the role that the rescue squad that you have played in saving his life many, many times. I'm giving you a second-hand account of addiction as my husband and I and the rest of our family have watched our son swivel away from addiction. And you, the rescue squad workers, have played a tremendous role in our son being alive today. How does a person say thank you? There was a time that I believed a person could just think positive enough and pull themselves up by their bootstraps and go on in life. Maybe that's why God gave me, in his infinite wisdom, he gave me a son with true clinical depression, bipolarism, anxiety disorders, OCD, PTSD. Maybe God did that because I now find that it's not what I have been able to do to help him, but what his life has taught me about these type of debilitating illnesses. Our son, RJ, is 74 days clean, which is a, his longest stretch of sobriety from drugs since age 14. Alcohol was never a drug of choice for RJ. Stating that my husband and I had a son that has addiction, that has been in active addiction for over six years, I'm sure you're wondering, where were you and your husband doing what were you doing as parents? Well, there are many answers to that. But to paint a word picture of how we felt, you know the story about the little frog that jumps into a pot of water. And if the water becomes hotter and hotter, the frog will stay there, even if he could get out. But finally he dies in the hot water because he never realized that the water was getting hotter and hotter. And I know you all have strong stomachs, so I'm sure you can take that story, but speaking of rescue squads and strong stomachs, my husband and I have worked as EMTs, just the basic EMT. We work with Haynes Ambulance Service in Montgomery, Campbell Ambulance Service in Troy, if y'all remember uh, Mr. Campbell, I think that he moved to Headland. Um, we were volunteer with You Follow Rescue Squad and of course volunteer in Clio, Alabama, which is also Tina and Chauncey's uh, hometown stomping grounds. But our most exciting time with the Rescue Squad was, squad was when we delivered a baby, or it actually delivered itself, we had nothing to do with it, between You Follow and Phoenix City on that rural stretch of US 431. I was in the back and Randy was driving and lucky for me, it was her seventh child. <laughs> it was her seventh child. She was okay. But the frog story to, seems to me is a true illustration of what we did. Each day, each week, each month, each year, we thought that he would get better. We tried to make his life better in all the ways that we knew how but we could not get him off drugs. The closest I had ever been myself, or my husband had no experience with drugs, the closest that I had ever been was when my Aunt Tammy, who uh, Tina knows very well, and my Aunt KK and my little sister Lana, as we were kids, we'd pull the leaves off those tall stalks of what's called rabbit tobacco out in the field, and we'd wrap it up and smoke it and hide from mama. Uh, and that was what we knew about drugs. Randy had a brother, and he's in the um, PowerPoint up here that's going around, the, the guy, the young man that's holding an infant. That's my, that's my husband who is uh, trying to get here. He's running late. That, his brother died um, with chronic, chronic long-term drug use being really the contributing factor. 
factor. And that was 20 years ago, and, and no one even talked about drug addiction then at, very much, and few people knew what to do. People on drugs were viewed as just a drug addict, and in many cases, that still seems true today. Many people view them as people that are hopeless to ever change. Having a child with addiction brings a great stress into a marriage relationship. It's so strange, the attention that needs to be addressed to the addict becomes directed toward the two people in the marriage. When parents in a marriage have a child die, that couple moves into an 80% bracket that, they will end, that their marriage will end in divorce. And that is because the, how the two people the two different ways that a male and female work through grief. Normally, us women, we like to talk about our pain. And the men, they don't want to talk about it. Men internalize most of their pain, and this is to some extent a learned behavior. Little boys don't cry, and they grow up, and they don't cry. I have been a licensed funeral director for 36 years and I've seen a lot of grief and I've studied grief from a textbook. I've seen grief in its most painful state. I've seen grief move into a state that is bearable and that means that I have seen grief-stricken people take grief and transform it into something else that's not as destructive as it can be. In our little town, we have two examples. We have Meredith's Miracles and we have Megan Kelly's Smile Foundation. Both of those organizations were founded in memory of two young, beautiful girls whose lives were cut short by cancer. Their mothers and fathers worked to take what was an unbearable pain and to do something good with it. But founding an organization in honor of a child that has died does not miraculously take away all the horrible pain of grief. It just gives the people that are grieving something positive to focus on. Losing a child is the number one worst thing that a marriage can endure, but I think that dealing with a child in addiction is number two. Knowing that men and women grieve differently, and when you're watching a child in addiction, it is a type of grief. It is a heartbreaking picture to watch unfold. And in the video above, you see RJ as a young boy, and then you see some of his adolescent pictures where you can see he's very sick with addiction. And then there's pictures taken where recently he's looking much better. This year, there is estimated 23.5 Americans are addicted to drugs or alcohol. Something that many people in society do not know is that there is a common denominator among addicts, and it is trauma. One of the best books that I've ever read is titled The Heart of Addiction by Dr. Lance Doe's, D-O-D-E-S, an MD, a psychiatrist, and a psychoanalyst. He works at, at Harvard University. So interestingly, one study that he performed that will stay with me forever, especially when I hear of a young girl that's acting out in a, ba in a bad way. And I'm talking about a young girl or an adult lady that's acting out with something that, that makes them be something that rhymes with the word door. <laughs> Dr. Doe's, D-O-D-E-S, went to one of the worst parts of Chicago where the prostitutes were lined up on the sidewalks. And he hired a driver and he got in the back seat of the car and he picked up the prostitutes. They immediately thought it was for the usual service that they provide. <clears throat> Of course, what is so sad is this continual cycle that they are caught in. Prostitution, they get the money, they use the money to buy drugs, and then they, have, they don't want to have to think about all the trauma in their life, so they do prostitution again, and the cycle goes on and on. 
But Dr. Dodes would just say, hey, I just want to talk. Because I bet his wife was listening somewhere. He would ride around with the prostitutes and talk. And at some point in the conversation, he would ask, if you had to say who you hate the most in the world, who would it be? And inevitably, and I could not find that word in spell check, but inevitably, a, the prostitutes would say, I hate my father, or either, either it was a stepfather. The male figure in, these, in their young years had somehow caused trauma in their life. That was very profound. The girls had been abused physically, emotionally, or sexually by a father or stepfather. And I do not tell that story in connection at all to RJ's father. RJ has a wonderful father. If he's here now, I, he, he has, is Randy Cahey. But today, with RJ's permission, I'm going to share some of RJ's trauma. Unresolved emotional and mental trauma propels millions of people into self-destructive addictions. Due to a trauma that occurred in RJ's life, and listen to me clearly, if you're pleased to understand. Ironically, the same type of trauma also occurred in RJ's dad's life, Randy, when he was a young boy. <clears throat> and in reading the Bible, I just wonder if there's some kind of, was some kind of generational curse, as I mentioned that story. Their situations were 40 years apart but both suffered extreme trauma in the same way. <clears throat> Due to what happened to RJ and then what happened to Randy, and first what happened to Randy years and years ago, and then about 15 years ago what happened to RJ, and it continues to happen to many, many more children, and they never tell. That has made our family become an advocate for a law that passed in Alabama in 2006. It is called Aaron's Law. Aaron Merlin was a victim of childhood sexual abuse. But Aaron Merlin has taken those devastating rapes that were imposed on her during her childhood by two different family members and through lots of work to heal mentally and emotionally from the extreme trauma of a childhood sexual abuse. Erin Merlin is now a national and international spokesperson to educate people of all ages, and especially children, in an age-appropriate way about what to do if victimized or approached by a sexual predator. Sadly, sexual predators of children are usually a relative or an acquaintance of the family. This makes the trauma even more complex in the mind of a child. A sexual predator's sole mission is to not be caught so they can continue in their evil, and which is, it is an addiction, their evil addic addictive behavior. My disgust and hate, and I know we're not supposed to hate, but I think Jesus understands the kind of hate that I'm talking about. Because I may not hate the person, but I know that person too, because I know that person too was probably traumatized or abused in some way, and they're acting out by imposing pain and horror on another person. But I do hate a sexual predator, and especially one who makes a child, who makes a child the victim. I hate their sickness, I hate their acts that they destroy the innocent lives that they victimize. And at best, it takes years of counseling and therapy and any other positive thing, and of course God, for a person to heal from such extreme trauma. I read an article the other day about a 20-year-old woman and man who were babysitting a 17-month-old little girl, and they were sexually abusing and videoing their heinous crimes. This continued for about four months before the mother realized that something was happening. The child had unexplained bruises and changes in the little girl's behavior. The couple was arrested. My husband, Randy, and his older brother, Ronnie, who was, of course, RJ's uncle, 
Randy and his brother Ronnie, who is no longer living, were sexually abused as children. Ronnie is pictured, again, in the video, holding RJ. In that picture, RJ was one day old. Ronnie died four days after that picture was taken. The he was 36 years old. The autopsy reported that it was arteriosclerosis, but Ronnie had long-term chronic and al drug and alcohol use. But when Randy and Ronnie were small children, they lived next door to a distant relative who, unknowing to Randy and Ronnie's parents, the man was a sexual predator. For the far, so far, the length of time that they lived there, which was a couple of years, Randy and Ronnie were sexually abused, and it was horrific. Why do they not tell anyone? The same reason that the other millions of sexually abused children do not tell. The same reason that my son RJ did not tell his parents. And this speech is not about the mental mindset of a sexual predator because I really don't know but I know that studies show that a sexual predator can never be rehabilitated. And I know that, that I do hate the act that they impose upon these young victims because I have seen firsthand the mental and emotional trauma that occurs in the lives of these young victims. Trauma that will last a lifetime, even in the best of situations. And I believe that trauma is what cut Ronnie's life short at the age of 36. Looking back now, Randy and I understand Ronnie's drug addiction. The mental turmoil that he must have felt as the older brother in such a terrifying situation as a child. But our family encourages everyone to take the time to watch the public service announcements that, that are on the internet that are done by Erin Merlin. Just as her voice quivers to, in, in talking about it, it, when I begin to talk more about RJ's, it, it, is, it is so unsettling. But as she has become a national and international spokesperson on this subject, beginning at the age of five, my son RJ was sexually abused by his step-grandfather. The step-grandfather was deceased before RJ told about these heinous acts that were imposed on his young body. A pocket knife was held to RJ's throat and he was told that if he told anyone that, this, that the stepfather, the man that was doing it, that he would kill himself and then it would be all RJ's fault. As a mother, I ask myself every day why I did not realize something was very wrong with RJ. Well, we did in ways, but we did not know what was the source of RJ's behavior and his illnesses. Later, RJ was diagnosed with PTSD due to childhood sexual abuse. And if anything good comes from my speaking tonight, Please let it be for the sake of your children or grandchildren or your friends with small children that you watch these public service announcements from Aaron's Law. Children rarely report the abuse because they are threatened that they will be killed or their parents will be killed. Can you imagine a young child's brain trying to process that kind of situation? Aaron's Law teaches in an age-appropriate way that it does not instill fear in children by giving them this information. But having this conversation in a way that Aaron has designed will give a child empowerment to know what to do if anyone ever tries to touch them in the places that their bathing suit covers. And RJ does say that if Randy and I, that if his parents, Randy and I, had talked to him about what to do if someone tried to touch him in his private areas, that he would have told us. If we had educated him about sexual predators. That one statement is all it took for me to try and tell everyone about Aaron's law. 
R.J. says that he knows, and I know, that the se childhood sexual abuse was a source of trauma that propelled him into drug addiction. R.J. and Randy and anyone else who is abused in that way at a young age never fully recovers. They can hope, only hope to find ways to mentally and emotionally recover. And there is help out there, but just like drug addiction, it is a process of recovery. During the same, same time frame that RJ, was, that the sexual abuse had began, which was unknowing to us, he was diagnosed with the worst case of obsessive compulsive behavior that Children's Hospital had ever documented and treated. That's a long story and I'll condense it and I'm sure y'all are glad. But the OCD behavior started about, started and by the third day, RJ was so convinced that germs was on everything. Germs was on his food, he thought. Germs was on his plate. Germs was on his glass. And he completely stopped eating and drinking. And we were told by the pediatrician that his need to eat and drink would be stronger than the OCD. And that's reasonable to believe. And that he would start eating and drinking. Well, he didn't. And by the third morning when he woke, his body was severely dehydrated. And we called the local ER and told them the situation. The ER nurse said that if in any possible way that we could take him straight to Children's Hospital in Birmingham. Randy, my husband, had left early that morning for a service at a distant location, so I had to just get one of the cemetery worker guys to jump in the car with me, and RJ and I sat in the back, and I, all the way to Birmingham, I tried to pry his mouth open to just get a piece of ice in it. When we got to Children's Hospital, he was going into shock from no food or water, no liquids. And now looking back, we piece that together as to what was going on with the sexual abuse by the step-grandfather. The more we understand more about RJ's behavior. When we got him to Children's Hospital, he had his hands in the air like he was trying to get germs off of things and he was just spitting and he was saying dirty, dirty. Everything, he thought everything was dirty. That's all he could say was dirty. But the step-grandfather had put things into his mouth that should not have been there. And RJ almost died from, the, from that incident. He stayed in Children's Hospital for about two weeks with teams of medical doctors surrounded by medical students would come into his hospital room every morning and they would discuss RJ's case. And with no disrespect to the brilliant doctors at Children's Hospital, but I just remember my child feeling like an animal in a cage. The medical team could not get RJ to eat. So finally they decided that it must be psychological so they wanted us to place our five-year-old son in the mental ward at UAB for 30 days with no contact with any family members. RJ already had separation anxiety, and I felt he would die if he, had sep if he was separated from me and his father and with no contact with his family for 30 days. But I now know that they were trying to separate RJ from all the family to see if a family member had somehow traumatized him. And they were right, someone had. But we refused to let them take RJ to the mental ward. We left Children's Hospital against medical advice. And one of my Sunday school friends, Lynn Twitty, was at home steady calling hospitals to find someone to take him. And Embry University said that they had an eating disorder unit. And so Randy took him straight there. When he got there with him, they evaluated him and said that he was not a candidate. 
that they treated people with physical eating disorders. And we were devastated. Randy had our child in the car and he was again becoming very dehydrated because he was off of the IV fluids. But within that same hour of us being told that RJ could not stay at Emory, I received a phone call on my cell phone and a man's voice came on and he said, Ms. Cahey, I was not one of your doctors, but I just felt like dropping by RJ's hospital room at Children's Hospital. And they said y'all had left. Through tears, I began to tell him what was going on. I said, we cannot find a hospital to accept RJ. See, he was being viewed as a psychological patient or a psychiatric patient. And just like 15 years ago, there's still a lot of improvement that needs to be made in mental health services. Our daughter is studying to become a counselor, and so maybe with her contributions to the, to the mental health, I hope we see a lot of improvements. But the man on the phone happened to be a child psychiatrist. His name was Dr. Gavin Brunsvall, and I'll never forget his name. I think if I lose my mind one day, I'll just walk around and say, Gavin Brunsvall, Gavin Brunsvall. Dr. Brunsvall said, bring RJ straight to my office and I will treat him every day as an outpatient for as long as it takes. And that was a miracle. After RJ was finished with him, with Dr. Brunsvall, RJ continued to receive psychiatric care and medication for OCD and anxiety. But later, one of the medications that he had taken through the years for psychological problems was featured on a television advertisement. The television advertisement showed a young boy with emotional problems, suicidal tendencies, unexplained weight gain, and then to further the young boy's problems, the advertisement warned that some young boys may grow large breasts. Between the ages of nine and 16, RJ had experienced all of those things that the young boy in the advertisement had had. Emotional problems, suicidal aspirations upon which RJ had acted upon, excessive weight gain, and large lactating breasts. At age 16, RJ had slimmed down a lot, and what we had thought was obesity that was causing his chest to be excessively large. Like any of us do, he would, had hid his, the, the large feature by wearing oversized clothing to conceal it. Us women know how to do that. If RJ had been able to make this speech, he was going to say that he felt like a model with Lane Bryant magazine but as his mother, I can't find any humor in it. RJ has a tremendous sense of humor, and one day I pray he'll be well enough to use that humor in telling his story. After we noticed the advertisement, we consulted a surgeon, and at the age of 17, RJ underwent a double mastectomy. The surgeon said that RJ had the largest breast that he had ever removed due to gyno gynecomasta. I think I'm, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. RJ can pronounce it. He is a wonderful, wonderful speaker, and I'm sorry that he couldn't do this, but it's gynecomastia. No doubt, RJ's drug addiction took his mind away from the strangeness that he felt at age 9, 10, 11, and up to age 17 with large lactating breasts. And I did not know they were lactating. He has told me that recently, that at about age nine or 10, that he started lactating. And if you can imagine what a child would feel like, a young boy doing that. RJ was homeschooled and like his older sister Lexi had done, at a certain point, they became eligible to take the dual enrollment college classes Lexi did great and RJ did great academically, but he began to become extremely anxious about test taking. He also is a perfectionist and 
that is actually a, can be a mental disability when you think that you had to do perfect on everything. And that's what started happening to him. He, he thought he had to make a hundred on everything. And of course we would talk to him, but when it's a mental thing, you, it, that, it's just very difficult. So that's what was going on. He wanted to make a perfect score on the test. The home environment that he had been accustomed to in contrast to a structured classroom setting presented a very high anxiety situation for him. So one day at college, a friend handed RJ a pill. And RJ said it, he didn't tell me about it, but he said it helped with the anxiety. So within a few months, RJ was up to taking that pill, which was a Norco. He was up to taking 60 10 milligram Norco a day. RJ began to use heroin as a filler in between getting the number of Norco that his addiction required. During the height of his addiction, he knew he could not continue to acquire the drugs in the small town that we live in without a high percentage of getting caught. So he had devised a plan to wait until Randy and I went to bed and RJ would drive three hours to another state to make the drug transaction, conceal the drugs in his vehicle, and drive home three hours, hoping and praying he would not get caught. Many times he returned home, and it would be about daybreak, and I'm usually an early riser, and he would meet me on the porch, and he'd tell me he had ran down to the convenience store to get a cup of coffee. If RJ had been able to do this speech, he was, he was going to say that you were probably amused at his choice of the verb praying. That he would drive home with drugs and he'd be praying that he would not get stopped. RJ says that drug addicts pray. He said he prayed his prayers actually were sometimes more like begging to God. He begged God that the sexual abuse would stop. He begged God to help him. When he was an obese teenage boy with large lactating breasts, RJ and I have had many in-depth conversations about his relationship with God. And the primary sin that he said he felt he was committing was the commandment that, Rosa, that Moses, not roses, Moses inscribed onto the tablet. Thou shalt take no other God before me. RJ said he felt that the drugs had become more powerful in his life than God. RJ has read the Bible through at least seven times and the book of Job and Revelations over 20. I questioned him many times that, RJ, if you die from a drug overdose, will you go to heaven? He always assured me he would. During the last two years of RJ's addiction, it had moved into a chronic disease level. His body was ravished with addiction. And RJ and I have been working on a book about his experiences as a drug addict. But during his times of addiction, RJ has seen things that no adolescent child should see. During the height of his addiction, he would have to go into environments in which he was tested to make sure he was not an undercover cop or a snitch. Meaning, if RJ reacted to anything in a way that the drug dealer thought RJ was a snitch or a cop, the dealer would have him killed. One example, and this is a very mild example, example for the book that we're writing about his experiences. Some of the things he's told me is, is just as hor horrible as anything you can imagine. But this is a bad example to us, but it's a small example to what he saw. This example, he saw a small girl get slapped, about a two-year-old girl, slapped so hard that she fell down unconscious for a few minutes. She was slapped by her father, who was the drug dealer. But thank God the little girl did gain consciousness and appeared to be okay. He said that he was 
going to move toward, here, toward her, and at that moment she began to get up. But if he had done that, he would have likely been killed or beat brutally. At one point in his acquiring of the drugs, the supplier resided in a gated community in a half a million dollar or million dollar home. When you get to half a million and million, there's really no difference. So lived in a tremendous home and RJ would go into the home, into the kitchen, and then inside of empty cereal boxes was cocaine and heroin. Now I'm talking about a 14, 15, and 16 year old boy being in that type of situation. RJ has nightmares and night terrors about the things he has experienced. There's a poem about drugs. It says, drugs will take you further than you ever wanted to go and make you stay longer than you ever thought you would stay. And that is so true. It is a miracle that RJ is alive today. Our son's name could be one of the many that's added to the thousands upon thousands that are dying due to addiction. And as a funeral director, I know that the certified death certificates are not reflecting the true number of deaths that have a contributing cause of alcohol or drug addiction. The statistics that we hear nationwide or statewide would actually be much higher if we had true figures. We know it is an endless list of extremely talented people who have died of drug use. Whitney Houston, there could not be a more talented human being. Whitney Houston, Kurt Cobain, y'all may not know Kurt Cobain. That's one of, RJ loves him. Um, put a gun to his head as big of a musician as, as there was. Um, Michael Jackson, of course, I mean, we know the talent there. And the list goes on and on. You know, we hear it on television every day of someone new that's uh, famous that's died of a drug overdose. RJ's first overdose came after an argumentative time with us, his parents. RJ wanted to drop out of the dual enrollment college classes. And in a tough love stance, Randy and I would not let him. So we sat in the college parking lot and we walk, watched him walk into the building where his class was. But unknowing to us, he simply walked out the back door and into a wooded area and ingested three bottles of Tylenol PM. And that was when they were still making Tylenol PM. Apparently ingesting so much so quickly forced his body to start vomiting. And I know y'all are EMT, so that's okay which accord or higher paramedics, according to the ER physician, that's what saved his life. That time he was taken to the ER in a car. His second overdose occurred in our pool house. Over the span of a couple of hours, RJ had ingested about 160 tramadol. That consumption caused a violent seizure. It dislocated his shoulder and he was in the ICU for several days. That time, one of his friends walked in the pool house and found him unconscious and called 911. Thank you, rescue squad, for saving my son. Another time, Randy and I was at the lake house for the weekend and RJ was staying with my parents, his maternal grandparents, and with the exception of the deceased step-grandfather, RJ is blessed with awesome grandparents. Randy's mother, Betty Cahey, and my parents, Harold and Lisa Carpenter, are exceptional. And he also had wonderful great-grandparents, great-grandmothers, who live long enough to be a vital part of RJ's life, Granny Alice and Ma, or Ma, we in the South at Ma. But like the drug awareness billboards illustrate, parents and grandparents, medicine cabinets and purses become drug toy boxes for kids. On another occasion, RJ was in a deep depression and he mentioned to a friend that he was going to kill himself. The friend called 911 and reported a suicide threat. By that time, no one was for sure where RJ was. So the 911 operator, personally knowing us, called our cell phone 
and said he had received a call that our son was about to kill himself and no one knew where he was. That was a 20 minute ride in, into town that I will never forget, not knowing if we would find our son dead. That time he had cut his wrist, but the cuts were superficial enough that he did not get a vein or artery. And I know this presentation sounds like Randy and I should be given Worst Parents in America Award. But I'm not telling you all of the talks and pleas and arguments and true love stances and prayers and every other thing that we have tried to do to help our son. One day I took him to the police station to let one of the officers talk to him. The officer talked to him for a long time, and I'll never forget, and I know God always has his hand on our lives, even in the worst of situations, when we feel like God has forsaken us. But at the police station, after a long time, the officer, and I'll never forget his name, Officer Lassiter in Andalusia, he came out with his arm around RJ's waist, and he said, Miss Cahey, your son is a troubled soul. He has a lot of pain in his life, but he's a gentle giant. He's a good boy, and he is. I wish he could have been here tonight. He is a very, very big young man. The reason that I took him to the police station because we had begun to have fear that he might walk into a convenience store or something and rob someone. But RJ never had any criminal activity, and the officer was right. RJ is a gentle giant, and he was a troubled soul, and RJ is a good boy. During the last two years when the addiction was at its height, Randy and I lived in daily fear of finding him dead. RJ began having very violent seizures. One episode that I'll never forget, we, have, we were constantly trying to find something that he was interested in. But with the drugs in a person's system, they cannot become interested in anything except where the next dose of drugs will come from. On this particular occasion, RJ was doing pretty good. He was working in the flower beds at our funeral home, at one of our funeral homes, the one next door to our residence. And our company CPA had came by. RJ, again, is extremely intelligent. and. I, because I know this sounds like he has no good qualities, but he does. RJ could absolutely walk into a college and teach world geography and, and other subjects. He couldn't teach math now, but there's, he is extremely intelligent. Um, and he's several times he's won the world domino tournament for his age division. He's exceptional in playing dominoes. He, he loves to, loved to coach basketball, and he coached in our city leagues and I'm not for sure how many years that he you know, had the winning team. Every, you know, RJ, everybody wanted to be on RJ's team. And then he formed an AA basketball team, and that's when you take the most skilled basketball players in a certain age group and you form a, an independent team, and they go all over the state and compete. Well, with that, he went to Nashville, Tennessee to, I'm not for sure if it was a national competition, but he went very far with his AA. But during all, with the AA basketball, him coaching it, but all that time he was struggling severely with drug addiction. And that's how hidden that drug addiction can be. I mean, we knew he had a problem, but I mean, you know, truthfully, I thought, I mean, is he taking three or four a day? I mean, I had, we had no idea the magnitude of the problem. RJ is also, has a, is a great vocalist and guitarist. But on this particular morning, I thought it would be good for him to sit down and hear the CPA talk. Maybe he would get interested in the management of our family businesses. Well, that went good for about two seconds, and I looked over at RJ's. He was sitting in the end chair at the conference table, and I thought that the movie The Exorcist was playing. I've never watched The Exorcist because when you own funeral homes, you don't watch scary movies. But RJ was making these terrible grot growling noises, chewing his tongue, his arms and legs was convulsing, blood was running from the corners of his mouth. Now, I know y'all are EMTs and paramedics. And I, and so we immediately called 911. And again, from the bottom of my heart, 
I thank you, the rescue squads, for responding so quickly and ensuring that our son's airway was open and that he did not strangle on his own blood. He, that time he did a lot of damage to his tongue. And God, with his merciful timing, allowed me, on another time, God, with his merciful timing, allowed me to walk into our house and at that exact time, I heard a loud noise and I ran to the bathroom where RJ was and he had fell in the shower, again, having a violent seizure. Thank you, Rescue Squad, for responding. The drug-induced seizures became very frequent during the last two years. RJ's body was about to call it quits, but we, we did not know that RJ was urinating solid blood he was in liver failure, and he knew that he was in liver failure. During the height of his addiction, he was daily ingesting 20,000 milligrams of acetaminophen. Now, that's why he should have done this speech, because he can pronounce words. I'm not even, y'all know what I'm talking about. What's in Tylenol? There are 325 milligrams of acetaminophen. Go, where's Chauncey? Chauncey, say that for me. Acetaminophen. <laughs> Uh, you, she's got it. I'm not even, I just can't do some words. And he was taking 60 Norco a day. That's 4,000 milligrams of, and that is a fatal dose. Five times the fatal dose. He was taking it every day. Our home is a large, sprawling, 5,000 square foot, 114 year old house. And it had became 5,000 square feet of terror for me and Randy. We lived in daily fear of finding him dead. Why did we not do an intervention? He re because he repeatedly told us he would kill himself if we made him go away into a rehab. And that was the reason we didn't. We have had friends who had had, had addiction and had gone into rehabs and that had been the solution for them and they would come and talk to us and tell us that's what we needed to do and we knew from an intellectual standpoint that's what we should do but all we could see when we thought of doing that we we'll see him walking into that college cl classroom building and then right after that he did try to take his life living with an addicted person is a terrible terrible thing Watching someone you love so much, and especially your child, come closer to death every day. Yes, we made mistakes in handling this situation. What our heart told us to do was stronger than what our intellect told us to do. The thought of him dying away from us was the sole reason we never forced him into treatment. He did go twice on his own. The first time he went to the journey at the Troy Medical Center in Troy, of course, I know there's only 14 days, but he walked out of there, and it's a medical detox program. It's a very, very good program. He walked out of there, and he was the RJ that I knew he could be. He was drug-free and probably had the happiest 25, 29 days of his life. He and I, has again, started working on his book about the, his experiences as an addict, and and it was wonderful. He was drug free. But one morning, a friend at the University of South Alabama called him to ask him to come down and help her move some furniture. So he went. And on the way back, an 18 wheeler ran him off the road and his 2013 Ford 150, and he wanted me to tell you all that to know how tough it was. He said that it, it I mean, he didn't say it did, it hit a concrete support beam under a bridge going about 80 miles an hour and the picture of the truck is in the pictures that you're looking at. Um, the man that picked it up, he said uh, that he had heard that, the, that it cut the young man's legs off because of course it was about three inches you know where his legs were and he's got big legs. He had no drugs or alcohol in his system when this happened. That night after RJ did not return home on time his dad went in an absolute meltdown. And I was trying to be positive and say, oh, it's okay, he just, his phone just died, he's okay. 
and Randy called the Evergreen State Trooper Office because that was the route that he would have been on, and they immediately confirmed that a young man had been life flighted to the University of South Alabama Trauma Unit. He was in critical condition, bleeding on the brain, lacerated liver, crushed femur, and thumb completely broken from the rest of his hand. He was life flighted from the scene. Thank you for the life flighting emergency team. That recovery period brought pain medicine back into RJ's life. Soon he was back at a near death level addiction level. As a parent, we have conversations with God as to why things happen. Why on the heels of him being clean for the first time in years did a terrible near death accident occur? And then another time I heard him fall we, we, and we ran to where, in the house and we ran to where he was and he was unconscious and his body appeared lifeless. We could not find a pulse and we could not feel any air coming from his mouth. I was on the phone with the 911 operator and she was ins instructing me as to what to do to see if he was breathing and etc. And Randy was on the floor holding RJ's head, his hands. And I asked the 911 operator if I could lay the phone down because I did not want to be holding a phone. I wanted to be holding his feet if he was dead. But thank you, Rescue Squad, for responding so quickly and so promptly and for moving a heavy, heavy diamond room table and picking up his 250 pound body off the floor and for saving his life. There are no words eloquent enough or profound enough to thank you for saving our son. Another near death experience, a kid driving a brand new Mercedes wanted to become a high roller in the drug distribution industry. So RJ, having a reputation for being a high roller drug addict, was called upon to help the boy bag the drugs up to sell. Now RJ never sold drugs because it took all the drugs he could get his hands on to keep his addiction maintained. But that night he helped the boy bag out, as they say, two ounces of heroin. RJ said that he got a free line of heroin for helping the guy, which is no surprise to us that heroin was cut with fentanyl. RJ said he had already used at least two grams of cocaine and three grams of crystal meth all within a few hours. That night, again, God in his infinite timing, I walked up on the porch and found him in respiratory arrest. I called 911 and I began mouth to mouth and the rescue squad re responded again promptly and relieved me by bagging him. RJ was on the ventilator in the critical care unit for about a week after that. Thank you again, Rescue Squad, for saving our son. One night, RJ and I had gone ahead and was having dinner because Randy was getting in late and he was acting fine, we were talking, and then he started trying to cut his hamburger with his car keys and, various, and he began to decline and he became unconscious and was aspirating on the hamburger meat. And I know y'all Rescue Squad workers, it don't matter. And I called 911. And a young female paramedic who I had watched, Randy and I had watched her grow up, her name is Mary Sasser. In Mary's early paramedic training years, she had honed her skills on the chaotic streets of Las Vegas. And Mary was also the daughter of one of our hometown Baptist preachers. Talk about an adventurous spirit. Well, Mary heard the dispatch of an overdose in 218 Stanley and I heard later that she stood up and she screamed, Bloo! said some words that her daddy wouldn't want to hear, RJ, stop this. When Mary and her co-workers arrived that night, they moved RJ's lifeless body to the gurney, hyperextended his neck to prevent further aspiration, and Mary pulled from his, from his pocket an empty gabapentin bottle. He had ingested 90 gabapentin that afternoon, in addition to the host of the other drugs in his system. Thank you, Mary, and thank you, Rescue Squads, for again saving our child's life. Later that night, RJ was life flighted to the Southeast Alabama Medical Center where he stayed a week in the critical care. 
His, he is now drug free. His abstaining from drugs has come in an unusual way. That last stay in critical care, we forced him into a treatment plan. While he was there, several psychiatrists and counselors visited him and we met with them and we decided to, they said he needed to go to the best rehab in America. It's in Arizona. Because we parents, we always want what's best for our children. Well, that rehab was a mere $57,000 for the first 45 days. So Randy and I were going to sell our house. I mean, truthfully, we were scratching and digging trying to figure that one out. And the website said that he would do a lot of hiking in the Arizona mountains and talking with other addicts about how bad his parents are. But even, and that's fine, if that's what it takes to you, well, I'm all with it. But even with knowing that that was the number one rated rehab in the United States, something in my heart made me just think that that was not the place for RJ's healing. And I thank God that he made me feel that way because we found a different answer that we think is going to be RJ's answer. We, I did a lot of research and I learned about a now Drextone, now Trexone, N-A-L-T-R-E-X-O-N-E -E implant. Uh, it is mentioned in the September 2017 edi uh, edition of National Geographic. And I'll, of course, condense that story. I know you're all glad. <laughs> I'm almost finished. Uh, we got passports, plane tickets, and we went to Nassau, Bahama, where RJ underwent an outpatient surgical procedure. It consisted of three vials. of a slow-release opiate antagonist chemical compound that's placed in the fatty tissue of the lower stomach. A Dr. George O'Neill from Australia created this. He is a great Christian man and a tremendous humanitarian in the medical field. I encourage you to go home and, and uh, research him, Dr. George O'Neill from Australia. The FDA is considering this now on implant for approval in the United States. And uh, Representative Seals over here, I think he worked with getting the rescue squads, some of them able to carry Narcan. And believe me, let them carry it. Let them have the Narcan anywhere that it can save a person's life. Because when it's your child's life, you want it saved. It has almost been like a miracle drug, a miracle procedure, this now tracks on implant because it stops any physical craving so they don't have to go through withdrawals. And if he did heroin, cocaine, or any opioids or, or alcohol, they would have no effect on him. And to let you know, of course, when he did it, they said, we know you're going to go home and test it. Now, he, he has not tested the heroin, cocaine, or opioids. He has not done that. But he did. He went to an Auburn football game, and he was in a bar with a bunch of kids his age, and they had a uber driver and he said i'm going to test it and, I, and i'll tell you what he did he did 15 beers and a bunch of jack and coke and he said he had zero effect i mean he should have been very intoxicated zero it did zero to him and but the next morning he had a terrible hangover so obviously if you have this implant you're you're just going to not do it i mean there's no reason to spend the money for the drugs or the alcohol because you're not going to get any effect from it um, his implant will be effective. And if I had gone to an Auburn game, I'd have probably had a drink too, because I'm an Alabama fan, roll tide. <laughs> That's probably why he did it. He's an Alabama fan too. Uh, the implant would been, will be effective for about 12 months, and we paid $8,000 for it, which, I mean, you know, believe me, just to think I can find something that's help my son with addiction, that was absolutely nothing. Uh, we will be glad to give anyone additional information about the procedure if you want to hit us up, Tina and Chauncey, they know how to get us. But during the remaining 10 months that he has, it's up to him to stay in the counseling, and he's in that, he's, he has an excellent counselor, and to fill his days with positive things, at, like giving him the opportunity to speak here, and I just, I'm so sorry, and it really, uh, his stress level was very, very high, and with bipolarism, of course, it, you know, it's a very changing mood, and the week before, he was awesome, and this, past, this current week we're in, he just really had a terrible week. 
Uh, but we thank you, Alabama Rescue Squad Association, for giving him the opportunity. You are the reason that our son is alive tonight. And a heartfelt thank you to all of you for always responding code blue without any pretense that it was just another drug addict. Because under the coarse exterior of my son, he has long hair, tattoos, he's a big boy. He was a broken little boy that had been repeatedly raped by his step-grandfather. He was a little boy that at age nine had lactating breast. And he was a little boy that was just struggling with the normal run-of-the-mill teenage problems. So thank you, Alabama Rescue Squad Association. Thank you.